let's get started. And well, uh, Alire, as many of you know, is a package manager, one more for the collection. And it's a language oriented package manager. So it runs in user space. It deals mainly with source uh, archives and is developed by the community. It's not an official package manager of any entity. And well, the project is in GitHub. We refer to Alayer as a whole as the project and also the community index, which is the place where the crates, which is also the name we use for projects, uh, where all the crates that are approved for the community are stored. And well, the command line tool is simply ALR to mimic other command line tools which is the tool that do does the things actually. <coughs> Here we can see the um, timeline of the project. And as you can see, between the last stable version and 2.0, there's been quite some time, more than we wanted. But the thing is that the big features in 2.0 were ready, I'd say, sometime before the release. but. In this time, I have become aware of a number of bugs and other issues that I wanted for them to be solved before releasing a, a big uh, stable version. So that took some time to fix. And the thing is, I'm not getting many reports of problems with 2.0. So I guess that was worth the effort. Uh, a bit uh, of the on the state of the ecosystem right now, we are now up to more than 400 crates. But since each crate has or can have several releases, we are over 1,000 releases. And as you can see, if we look into the categories, the embedded category is the most popular in the sense that there is a strong community, I think, developing for embedded devices, leveraging the the projects in, in a live. In regard to use, uh, if we go to the statistics in GitHub, well, we see this number of almost 100,000 downloads, but this is overly optimistic because we use those releases also in our, our internal testing, so this inflates the numbers. But for example, the installer for Windows, we don't download ever so that those are real downloads by users and we see already a, quite a number of downloads of, the, of that installer so that's a good indication of of interest by the by the people and now moving in, into actual novelties in 2.0 in for the community we have now official support for homebrew and mac ports on mac os of course uh, thanks to C Simon Wright. And for now, we test it only in the Intel architecture because this is what is available or was available in GitHub runners. But soon, I hope we will have also tested the uh, runs with the with the, the new architecture uh, for the for the Macs. And we have also support for other for other platforms that uh, we are not testing at the moment. So. In theory, they should work or they could work, but we are not testing them actively. So that's something for the for the to-do list. The community, I'm proud to say, is uh, is not only me as main developer and Fabian also as a, a developer in the project. We have actually quite a number of contributors, so that gives an idea of the uh, liveness of the of the project. And also, you can see that the number of pull requests between the two stable releases is, a, is, is quite large. So this was a, a release with a lot of new things, much more than I can tell in these 15 minutes that I have. So I'm going to go through the gen more general use cases, highlighting some small new features. And then I will devote uh, a bit of time to the two or three bigger new features. And for example, uh, the most simple use case in a layer is to retrieve a project, maybe to compile it, test it, and so on. We do that with get. And for example, now get will tell you if the project contains nested projects. 
nested crates so you can be aware that there is a demo or some test suit or, or things like that and the same happens when you do a layer width so you can be aware that there is some extra things within the crate not only the main main, main library or, or whatever also, you can invoke this feature explicitly with uh, with this command. And for example, this gives you a list of everything that is an outlier crate in your current working di directory. So this is an extract of my current working directory. And that can be a lot, of course, if you develop a, a lot with a layer. Uh, initialization of crates. Uh, is now or can be now if you want interactive. This is a feature by Fabien, by the way. And basically it asks you for all the information that will go into the metadata of the of the crate. And well, this depends. I people that prefer things to be more interactive, people that prefer everything to be automated. Now you can choose whichever you want. And also this happens when you try to edit for the first time. So it's not defaulting to an editor or assuming that you have an editor installed. So the first time you try to edit a, a project, it will ask what, for which editor you want to use. Uh, one of the new, really new features is the install command that allows you to, uh, so to say, export uh, a project outside of the allier uh, influence, so to say. Basically, it builds the project and uses GPR install to make the, the executables available in a standard uh, prefix. So, not only this will install all the executables you need, but um, if your crate has or needs extra resources that are not only binary, for example, support databases or data files, they will end in a in a standard standardized location where it can be used uh, easily retrieved by other programs and so on. You can also install binary crates, uh, so this way you can make an executable available for you for your user easily because you only need to add one path to the to your to your path. Or you can test install the crate that you are developing right now. And well, this has nothing to do with install, but it's also a change and a feature that you now can test locally the, the crates just like they are tested in our uh, continuous integration checks when you submit a crate to the index. All right. Other feature that has seen a few new features is the publishing assistant. Uh, before, when you pu published a crate, you ended with a manifest file that you had to submit to the GitHub repository manually. Now, if you want, uh, as long as you provide a GitHub access token, a layer pu publish can open the pull, pull request for you. It will give you the details to locate the pull request and so on. And the request is left in draft mode. This, this way, we maintainers are not notified because first the checks ha uh, on the crate have to succeed. You have a new uh, flag status to query your pull requests. As you can see here, I can have a pull request that has successfully been tested, that has failed, or that is still on, uh, ongoing tests. And when you know one or other outcome, you can either request the actual review or cancel the, the pull request. And now for news related to dependencies, the search of uh, libraries has been improved so now it on, not only by default looks into names and descriptions, but also in other places of the met metadata, and it will tell you where uh, where the hit in the search has happened, so you can locate things more easily. And this, by the way, is also by Fabian. And there is also now the possibility to do reverse searches in the sense that you can look for which projects depend on maybe your projects so you can know 
who is using your projects, for example. You can get the direct dependencies on a project and also the indirect dependencies on your projects across all the intermediate steps that may be necessary. For example, this world game depends in our list, which in turn depends in Adatom to load the files and so on. And if you want, you can find all the dependencies that exist by, uh, by all paths of dependencies. And finally, uh, the, I think the biggest change in 2.0 is the new shared builds feature, which in practice is transparent, but it's a big change in how things work in a layer. So that's why I will devote a bit more of time to this. In, in the past, uh, what you got, and you can still work like that way if you use this setting if you say that you don't want shared dependencies you can work as as always but what happened is that if you added a dependency to your crate those dependencies would be all inside your local workspace kind of like a virtual environment in python for example and so this means that if you have a lot of projects you have a lot of redundant downloads and a lot of redundant builds and so on with the new behavior, which is the default, when you add a dependency on your working directory, you won't see anything different because now dependencies go to a standard location that, of course, you can change. And they are split into different places, uh, starting from the bottom, which I have called the vault for lack of a better name. What we have is a initial download, which is read-only, and that's unique because for its release, we have a unique uh, download. And then for every build with a unique configuration, we have a separate folder where sources are initially copied and then actions are run and finally the build is performed. So for a single release, we can have many different builds. How we determine which builds are necessary? The idea is that no build should be done more than once. In practice, there may be tricky situations that, where this is not true, but you can check what is even used to create those unique build identifiers in a file that it's inside each uh, build, precisely. And you can see here that all the build switches, the compiler version, uh, the profile for the build, are obvious factors, but also since dependencies recursively can be configured in different ways, every dependency is also used to, to compute this bit. This uh, obviously has an impact in that now there will be many different builds for the same release. Uh, still, we don't have any management for that. Mm, we will see how, how much impact this has in this usage and things like that. But if you only use, for example, the standard development and release uh, profiles, at most you should end having two or three builds per release, which is not that bad. This obviously is reflected in, in the environment for the build of the projects. Now it's not the release directory that it's in the path, but it's the unique build uh, identifier that it's in the path. This means that we cannot compute this value until everything is known. And this means that we have to wait for the latest moment, moment possible to generate these shared build places, which is just before launching a potentially successful build. So all the configuration variables are defined and so on. In practice, then at this moment, just before the build, if the build ID is still empty, at that moment is synchronized from the pristine release sources. And at that moment, the post fetch is run only once because that's conceptually the moment in which this build is being uh, made ready for compilation. And this is a change that some people have noticed and has broken some workflows, but conceptually uh, there is no other way that it can be because until build, we cannot know this compilation build. You can check where the things are right now using the alire version uh, command. 
And to finish, a couple of things that are here and there. For example, in indexes, then we have seen some also uh, news. For example, now when you need to use metadata from a crate, it's not loaded at the beginning, which was getting quite slow with the growing size of, of the index. Now only the crates that are necessary are loaded, and that means that many workflows are much faster. Also, we have seen people asking a lot of times why this project is not showing in my search or this dependency I cannot use it. It's because before, unless you explicitly refreshed the index, you will, will, will not get the, the new releases. And now this is, happens once a day, if you want, of course. And also, we, you can access indexes over SSH. So for private indexes, Maybe it's simpler to use a, a local path or a network drive, but now you can also use a server in your in your local network without problem. And finally, a note about uh, breaking changes in this new release. Besides the this new build system that has moved things around, so some manual cleanup may be needed. Um, I think the biggest potentially um, dangerous change is that now we enable by default uh, full compliance with uh, Unicode sources. And as long as everyone is using that, there is no trouble. But uh, well, we were afraid that this could be a big disturbance in the force. But for now, we, no, we are not seeing many reports related to this. So it seems the transition is happening smoothly. And finally, now, yeah, before you could download compilers to a specific locations with a layer toolchain, now this is this should be done with either install or of you if you need the the structure in the zip file, you can do that with the get, which was already redundant. I will skip this. You can check in the repository if you are interested because I'm over time. And so that's it. Uh, I hope some of these new features will help you and for anything that it's not you can always ask and and that's it also questions online maybe there's one question I don't, I'm not sure it's for um, Alejandro actually, because so I'm going to read it. Uh, do you have any reports of other language server misbehaving when the toolchain and the server are installed solely with Alia? I think it's more a question for the other language server. Problem. Yeah, I, I, I personally, I don't get reports about this, but it's true that when I try to use VS Code with the plugin, sometimes I see strange things, and I have not stopped to to try to get to the bottom of the problem. But I think this would be for Maxim. Yeah. 